Sarah, I think there was a hosta takeover of our uh, gardens. I, I say that, and I have to admit, Janine said to me, Sarah must have planted all those hostas. Did you see them? And I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> like, they weren't puppies or skis, so I didn't notice them. But I'm sure they're beautiful, and I'll notice them on the way out. So thank you for that uh, ministry. Sarah's sharing with their abundance of uh, vegetation from her property. So 2 Corinthians, why 2 Corinthians, or as one famous celebrity was roasted for calling it a few years ago, 2 Corinthians? Um, there's a lot of good reasons, and these reasons are beyond the fact that it's the next letter in our Bibles, and last year we looked at 1 Corinthians. Uh, a few reasons I'm going to give you for that. Uh, it's home to way more choice kind of scripture memory top 10 type passages than you realize. You know, many people in the room could probably finish the, the quote, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, and not remember, oh, that's actually in 2 Corinthians or in verse 5. But even a key little passage like that, it kind of ends up getting used often as like a, a, an inspirational, uh, hey, you can do this, or, uh, you know, you were magically transformed when you became a Christian, and um, some of those things might have some truth to them, but it has a context in this great letter that we're writing, and it's about, uh, you know, so much more than we might think. That could go for many of the scripture references. Um, some of the great themes in this passage, in this letter... Uh, includes suffering, suffering, and the purpose of suffering, and what we're to think in the time of suffering, and, and many of you have experienced uh, profound suffering, and maybe wondering, you know, where was or is God in all of that kind of thing, and uh, another theme in this, in this great letter is reconciliation, um, genuine ministry or authentic credentials for spiritual leaders. I realized a number of years ago, as I started to think about who all my, you know, spiritual uh, mentors or heroes or, you know, the ones that end up being authorities in my thinking in my life, they were all authors. They were like just people that wrote books. Well, in the first century, not a lot of people owned scrolls. Um, they were kind of shared, and they were very valuable, and so I don't think celebrity authors were the, the go-to guys in the first century for who uh, people followed and who were the big influencers. Paul kind of talks about some timeless things uh, for that kind of thing. Um, you know, in our day and age, uh, even the fact that maybe my heroes were authors, that's probably better than uh, people that have the most uh, likes on Instagram or, or most podcast uh, you know, subscribers. But in the first century, like I say, you know, book ownership was limited. Celebrity authorship was pretty rare. Internet popularity, very limited. I understand the internet was very sketchy. In the first century, it would be like bell service in Brooklyn. Uh, but that's another joke. Uh, and uh, all, these are just some of the things I'm going to pick up in a few minutes, but we're actually, uh, I seem to be in a funny mood today. We're, we're going to take a cartoon break right now. So, Cindy, you can put that up. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Even though it's called second or two Corinthians in our Bibles, there are multiple clues within this letter that it's not the second thing he ever wrote to the church of ancient Corinth. Paul started this Jesus community in Corinth some time ago on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 18. And after moving on, Paul got a report that things were not going well there. So he wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians to correct these problems. And it appears that many in the church rejected Paul's teaching in that letter and rebelled against his authority. And so we learn in this letter that Paul had followed up in person with what he calls the painful visit. And after that, he sent a letter which he says was written with anguish and tears. And so after all these measures, most, but not all, of the Corinthians realized their arrogance and they apologized to Paul. They wanted to reconcile. And so Paul wrote this letter to assure them of his love and commitment. The letter's been designed with three main sections, each addressing a distinct topic. So Paul first finalizes his reconciliation with the Corinthians. Then in chapters 8 and 9, he addresses the topic of forgotten generosity. And in the final chapters, Paul challenges the remaining Corinthians who still reject him. Let's dive in and you'll see how it all works. 
So Paul opens up by thanking the God of all mercy and comfort who brought peace and encouragement to him and the Corinthians during this time of division and dispute. He acknowledges that things have been tense since this painful visit and he makes clear he's forgiven them, he wants an open and honest relationship. But why had they rejected Paul in the first place? Well, we discover later in this letter that the Corinthians had disregarded Paul as a leader. He was poor, he earned a meager living through manual labor, he was under constant persecution and suffering, he was often homeless, and to top it off, he wasn't a very impressive public speaker. And so once the Corinthians were exposed to other, more wealthy, impressive Christian leaders, they started to think less of Paul, they were actually ashamed of him. So Paul responds first by showing that their elevation of these leaders simply because of their wealth and eloquence is a betrayal of Jesus. It shows a totally distorted value system. True Christian leadership, Paul says, is not about status or self-promotion. Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as captive slaves to King Jesus who's leading them on a procession of triumph. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but rather to point people to the one who is. Jesus. He then alludes to the recent demand of the Corinthians that he provide some letters of recommendation to prove his authority and credentials, and this is ridiculous to Paul. Their church wouldn't even exist if he hadn't started it, and so he says they are his proof of genuine leadership. They are his letter of recommendation. He cleverly quotes from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel, saying that God's Spirit has written his letter of recommendation on their hearts as his new covenant people. The Corinthians shouldn't need any more proof than that. Now, the mention of the new covenant, it leads Paul into a long comparison between the old covenant between God and Israel that was mediated by Moses and the new covenant between God and the Corinthians mediated by Jesus and the Spirit. The old covenant made at Mount Sinai, it was truly glorious. It made Moses himself shine with God's glory, but that glory eventually faded. Not to mention the fact that the laws of that covenant were ineffective at truly transforming Israel. But the new covenant, by comparison, is even more glorious because the resurrected Jesus is the very glory of God and he lives on forever. And it's his spirit that's now transforming people to become more faithful just like Jesus himself. Now this all sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to share in God's own glory? But Paul goes on to show how the paradox of the cross turns upside down the Corinthians' ideas of glory and success. After all, Jesus' glorious exaltation as king took place through his suffering, execution, and death. On the cross, Jesus revealed God's salvation. He died for the sins of the world to reconcile people to God, but the cross does even more. It reveals God's character. He's a being of utter self-giving, suffering love that seeks the well-being of others. The cross also reveals a new cruciform way of life, and Paul's goal is that his life and ministry imitates the cross. So although his apostolic career has been marked by humility, suffering, by poverty, it was all to serve the Corinthians. And so when they disapprove of Paul's poverty and suffering, they disapprove of Jesus too. Paul's way of life and leadership is actually the proof that he authentically represents the crucified and risen Jesus. Paul really wants to reconcile with the Corinthians, but he won't let things lie until they've been transformed and embrace this upside-down paradox of the cross. After this passionate appeal, Paul moves on to address the topic of forgotten generosity. So the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem, they had fallen into poverty due to a famine. And Paul was raising money among the new churches that he started, full of mostly non-Jews. They would all send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in the Messiah, Jesus. And so many of his churches, they were thrilled to give. But the Corinthians, in the midst of all this conflict with Paul, hadn't saved up for the gift. And for Paul, this isn't just about money. It's another sign that the Corinthians have not been transformed by the gospel about Jesus, which at its heart is a story of generosity. Paul says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He's telling the story of the gospel through financial metaphors. Jesus gave up his glorious honor, 
or wealth, and he lowered himself to die like a poor slave so that other people who are impoverished through sin and death can be exalted and become wealthy through the riches of God's grace. To be a Christian is to let this story sink deep into your mind and heart, letting it transform you into someone who's more generous, more willing to share your life and resources to help others. In the final section of the letter, Paul focuses on the main source of his conflict with the Corinthians, that group of impressive leaders that he sarcastically calls super apostles. So they came to Corinth promoting themselves and bad-mouthing Paul as a poor, unsuccessful leader. And at the risk of sounding self-promoting, Paul says, do these guys really want to compare credentials? He can totally take them on. Are they Jewish Bible experts? Well, so is Paul. He was a Pharisee, for goodness sakes. He has the whole Bible memorized. Do they want to brag about their superior knowledge of Jesus? Paul has actually seen and hung out with the risen Jesus. He's actually had visions of Jesus' heavenly throne room. But more importantly, Paul has given his entire life to the mission of Jesus. He sacrificed comfort and stability, and he never asked the Corinthians for money. Unlike the super apostles who charged a lot, Paul earned his own living. But, Paul says, he refuses to brag about these accomplishments because these aren't the things that really matter as a Christian. Instead, what he'll brag about is how flawed and how weak he is because it's in those inadequacies that he discovers the love and mercy of Jesus. Or as Jesus once told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect through weakness. Paul concludes the letter with a sober warning to the Corinthians. They need to check themselves. Their contempt for Paul, his way of life, their love for these super apostles, it all shows that they don't grasp who Jesus is on a fundamental level. They're not living like transformed followers of Jesus, and so he invites them once again to humble themselves before the love of Jesus. 2 Corinthians gives us a really unique window into the life of Paul and the paradox set before us by the cross of Jesus. The cross challenges our values, our ways of seeing the world. We value success, education, wealth, but God values humility and weakness because his love and power were made known through the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. The cross also unleashes the transforming power and presence of the Spirit to empower Jesus' followers to take up his cruciform way of life and make it their own. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Sorry, you can see that there's a lot of uh, really important themes in this passage. Um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, reference more than the first two verses if you take a look at them this morning. Um, so, because you're thinking that was a long explanation. How long is this going to be today? We're just really kicking off this whole theme of 2 Corinthians. And, uh, you know, Paul starts the letter off. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth and to all of his holy people throughout Greece. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So that's like, okay, so it's a letter and it's written by somebody. This just seems like a giant exercise in uh, Captain Obvious kind of things. Um, But what I want you to think about are some things that I've learned as I've been preparing for this in the last month that are a lot more important than I ever really gave them, uh, ever really realized before. Uh, one, one is the idea that it's because we have First and Second Corinthians in our Bibles that we know so much about this one particular city in the first century. Now, I'm just saying if, if I was a preacher in the 1800s, and I was preaching from First and Second Corinthians, I would have been telling you a lot of what was going on in Corinth and it's all, it all would have just been inferred from these two letters. And since that time, so many archaeological discoveries and historical discoveries have come along thinking, Corinth is exactly like it was described in this ancient book uh, of uh, the Bible in the New Testament in First and Second Corinthians. It's a little bit of, a, of, a, of another example of the trustworthiness of our, of our Scripture, something that the young people are going to be studying out in the portable this fall. Um, In the author, uh, the author of the commentary that the women are going to kind of use as a guide in their study, he has this to say about Corinth when Paul arrived. He, He writes this, when Paul showed up in Corinth for the first time, he found a city with a Roman face, that's the political situation, 
a Greek heart, that was the cultural situation, and a large Jewish minority, and a deeply ingrained universal desire to impress. Now, this is not the only century in all of time when that's been a problem for people, but I thought that's particularly relevant in the culture that we're living in right now. A deeply ingrained universal desire to impress. What, what does that do when that cultural idea really gets soaked right into the wood, gets right in there to your inner life, and then you start reading the Bible and evaluating ministry and what's up and what's down and all your values, when that's such a big value for you? Um, You know, I I thought, man, what if in 1 Corinthians, if social media existed back then? Uh, What I also want to highlight this morning about 2 Corinthians is that even though it shares a title, it's not as much a sequel of 1 Corinthians as you would think by 1 and 2 Corinthians. I happen to own seven of the nine DVDs in the Rocky franchise. So I have them all in my basement. Sometimes I pull them back out and start watching that series. So it's not like 1 Corinthians is Rocky 1 and 2 Corinthians is Rocky 2. It's more like 1 Corinthians is Rocky 1 and 2 Corinthians is just like Rocky 5. And 2, 3, and 4 have been lost for all time. And, and so it's hard to really piece it all together what's missing. You, you saw in that description there's like other visits and a painful letter. And so Paul's referring to things and we don't even know necessarily what he's referring to. Um, and that, that's something that's complicated about studying a letter. But it's important for us to know that. It's, uh, sometimes we, we uh, even in our elders, the five of us start an email chain and somebody forgets to hit reply all in, in, in response number four. And then you get down to number eight and it's like, are we even talking about the same thing anymore? And, and uh, you know, what's got lost in the shuffle? You think of time delays. The, the uh, second Corinthians, first Corinthians and second Corinthians, you're talking about a seven year period between these two letters. That's a long chunk of time. And we live in an era where I buy paper towels for church on Friday morning from Amazon and they're on my front porch by Saturday and I can bring them in here on a Sunday morning. Getting letters back and forth and having these kind of dialogues as an apostle would have been a whole lot of time delay and slowness. So if you think about it, we've already hinted that he had, he had talked about some really kind of heinous sin in that congregation. And he writes, hey, it's been reported to me, somebody's sleeping with their stepmother. Stop. And then now it's like, it would be months later before Paul uh, gets that message to them. And then by the time he finds out what's going on, like, so, so here he is still responding to those same problems over a seven year period. That's, that's hard for us to really think about and understand. And then there's the whole idea of what letters represented in the first century and how kind of important, um, authoritative um, binding that they were. It, it's been a long time since any of us used an official seal. Most of us know from kind of watching old historic dramas or things like that. There's an idea that a scroll is rolled up and then they would drip wax on the seam and then they would take some time, if you've ever heard the phrase, signet ring. Well, what that would mean is that that king or that royal official, he'd have like a, an engraved thing on his ring and he would just stick that into the wax. And then now you have to break that wax in order to open it. So you knew the message got there securely, but it basically meant everything in here, I stand behind. I, I'm on the line for, uh, you know, I agree with, or my authority as an official is, is on this whole letter. Um, so, you know, translators say, uh, you know, if you look at the very end of 1 Corinthians, Paul all of a sudden says, uh, here's my greeting in my own handwriting. And they always... Bible translators always put that in capital letters. I think I have that up on the slide. And it's like, oh, they must assume Paul was angry when he was saying this. You know, it's like an email with, hey, why? Hey, mom, knock off on the all caps. It sounds like you're angry. That was Paul putting his autograph. Means a lot of these letters that Paul wrote, he's, he's dictating it to a scribe. Somebody's writing for it. You know, you can imagine Paul pacing back and forth. He's thinking his thoughts out. But at the end, of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, you know, in my own handwriting, I'm saying this. It's like our, our signature on the end of a legal document. At the end of 2 Corinthians, you'll find Paul saying, my final words on all this are, and I already read to you at the beginning, he's claiming his apostolic authority in the first verses, 
And then at the end, he's saying, my final words on these things are, it's the same whole idea. Everything in between, Paul's claiming have apostolic authority. It's important. The whole format that you saw sketched out up there, another interesting thing that wasn't really mentioned here, because that's a similar format we see in all Paul's epistles, it's incredibly unoriginal. Um, I don't know if they still in school teach how to properly write a letter. Um, I'm not sure. You're wondering if I was ever taught that as you've gotten my emails. But, you know, we, we, we hardly even teach that anymore because who writes letters anymore? Who, who gets letters anymore? But, you know, there's a basic format for writing what's considered, what was considered in the 1970s anyway, a proper letter written and a format for it. There was a proper format for a regular educated person in first century Rome. And this format that Paul uses, any Roman pagan would have used the same formula when they're writing a proper letter. They would have um, started out with... Uh, uh, I've got it kind of written here. Uh, it would start out with a greeting and then a prayer. A prayer, right? Yeah, it, there would be a prayer to their pagan gods of the, of the city or wherever they live, but a, a greeting, a written prayer, then a long section about why they're writing the letter in the first place, and then they would close it off with special salutations and you know, personal greetings to common friends that they might have. So Paul's using a regular format of how a letter would be written and given, and uh, I think that's just something for us to, to understand and know as we read this letter. Almost every one of Paul's letters that he writes in the New Testament are written for a specific situation. There's something going on in the church or churches that he needs to address. It's not true of all of them, but in, in most of them. And uh, sometimes we don't always know all the details of what the exact situation was that Paul's writing to. Um, sometimes we can figure it out, but it's not necessarily so crucial <laughs> because we kind of learn from the Apostle Paul who's handling a situation of some kind. We can learn all kinds of principles and ideas and truths that we need to know to handle various kinds of situations as a Christian. The letter was written over 2,000 years ago. How can it still be relevant in 2023? Well, one thing I would say it's because it's the Bible, because it's God's Word and has a unique kind of authority and power to it. And, and I know that's a circular argument, uh, possibly, if you know what those are, but it, it also is uh, important because the time has proven that circular argument. You know, I, I mean, well, why? Because I said so, you know. Um, I've read, I, I read a number of times that Dolly Parton, well, where is this going? That Dolly Parton wrote, um, Jolene and I will always love you on the same day. And, you know, I used to think, well, that's a pretty good day at work. You know, in 1974 when she's 27 years old, I, I did a little fact checking this week and found out she's kind of like backed off on that story and said, they're both on this one little cassette that I had in a little cassette player while I was writing them. So she can't remember if it was the same day, but it's within a couple of days or maybe within a couple of weeks as she wrote those two classic songs that people are still singing and covering and re-recording and listening to 50 years later. There's just something about those songs that really resonated. So they've had a 50-year shelf life. Well, Paul's letter has had a 2,000-year shelf life. Like, I really don't think anybody's necessarily going to be in a coffee shop singing Jolene in 4,023. That's how long it would be. But here we are around this letter that Paul wrote to a church, and it's still growing people in their discipleship and their faith 2,000 plus years later. It's another proof of the power of God's Word. Like I said also, the, we, it is a seven-year story. Uh, and, it, and it's a very messy church still that he's writing to. I don't know if that should discourage us or encourage us, but it's a little bit of an idea that you just don't go from A to B and be a fully functioning, mature Christian church in, in, a, in a short amount of time. It's a messy church. But Paul says this in writing to this one of many messy churches. He says, besides everything else, this is, we'll get to this all the way in chapter 11. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul's not merely saying he's a neurotic there. And I, there's something about me. I can't stop being worried about all the churches. He's claiming 
a certain kind of authority over a huge swath of churches. Um, that's, that's good for us as uh, people from the tribe known as Baptists because we tend to be very strong on our autonomy of the local church. And we have to kind of balance that. Here the Apostle Paul, who's not omnipresent, he can only ever attend one church at a time or be at one, yet he seems to be intimately part of and overseeing a large number of churches all at once. Um, and that unity of all of them. But getting back to the idea that this one's a mess, um, and we're going to bump into a whole lot of passages and, uh, in this letter. And if you know anything about 2 Corinthians, or if you read, I'm going to give you some homework in a little while. If you're listening to or reading it, you might be thinking, oh boy, we, John's going to be giving us a whole bunch of sermons about why Paul as, is a real apostle and not a fake apostle. Well, Paul's never arguing about his credentials because he's so concerned about his credentials. Paul's arguing and saying these things because he's so concerned about the mess that's in this local church, and he's trying to do everything that he can to, to right this ship and, and use his authority to put them on the right path. So his big concern isn't his own credentials. It's this church and the mess that's in I would say at this time in Paul's life, he has many irons in the fire. We had our Feb church planning director here at a, at a monthly pastor's meeting just, just last month, Tom. And Tom is now, he's been the church planning director planting, you know, uh, it slowed down a little bit through COVID, but at one point we were planting 15 churches a year within our movement. And if you know anything about church plants, they're very high maintenance for quite a long time. So you start doing the math, and Tom had a very active and busy job. And then now he's temporarily the, the overseer for all of our churches because they're looking for a new director. So he's got all of these things going. The Apostle Paul had a lot of plates spinning at this time. And his desire for this local church is to not have to be a hands-on overseer, that they would reach a level of maturity and health that they could continue to move forward and he could go on to other things. We know that he wants to go to Spain and start planting churches there. But he doesn't feel he can because of the shape that they're in. So here's this idea. And that's only because he's an apostle, capital A. If he's just a guy that used to be the pastor there, he could say, I am done with you guys. It's not my circus, not my monkeys. You guys deal with it. I'm going off to somewhere else. No, Paul still feels an obligation. So we can look at this letter and think, what does a capital A apostle feel uh, disqualifies the church from qualifying as mature and ready to move forward for what they were created for? Those are some of the things we want to look to read and learn. He doesn't feel it's safe to do that nor does he feel that he really has it. So we hope to discover a, a better description of a gospel ministry as we study 2 Corinthians through this fall and then into the winter after a break for Advent. Our overview told us that he uh, deep dives into the theme of weakness. Weakness. That's a really relevant theme for us at this time. Um, Many ministries are feeling a real sense of weakness um, in this post-COVID period. And uh, you know, I know it's superstitious to knock wood, and this is metal anyway, but let's hope that that post in post-COVID is something that, that stays. But I, I have a sense, a lot of my pastor buddies, I've never really seen a time when so many of my pastor buddies simultaneously feel called elsewhere uh, all at once in such a short amount of time. And, and I came up in an era where seven years was considered a long time for a pastor in a ministry area. There's a lot of people really struggling. There's a lot of people suffering and having all kinds of questions. I saw a sarcastic meme this week, which caught my attention, like puppies and skis would. And it reflects a lot of what I sensed a lot of my peers are feeling. The meme was a picture of a beautiful waterfall that said, you're doing the best you can, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> that, that's, that's a joke, people. You know, and that's how a lot of people are feeling. And uh, I would think if the Apostle Paul really caved into the pressure he was under from this church in Corinth, that's kind of the message he would have been getting. You're doing the best you can, Paul, which is kind of embarrassing because we know what a successful leader really looks like. And Paul's like, oh, do you? And 
we're going to have some of that conversation. Uh, in, the, in 2 Corinthians, we're going to learn many excellent perspectives for the current time we live in that will challenge us to live by faith in a broken world, embracing our, our weakness and living in the strength that God himself supplies. That's from one of my commentaries this week. But a lot of people in that congregation, as we saw in our overview, they are just, they're just done with Paul. They're ready to move on from Paul. What was it about Corinth that caused them to lose confidence and respect in Paul? Right, we're going to end up considering a number of different passages that are Paul's responses to their accusations. Like I said, we're missing the letters. We won't even know what all the accusations necessarily were. But there's at least two main factors that contributed to their unhappiness with Paul. Um, we took quite a bit of time last fall talking about all these special interest groups with their own favorite celebrity speakers. I don't need to over, go over them too much more, but, uh, you know, we had that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter in the beginning of 1 Corinthians. It's not hard to think of those Greeks loving somebody that other parts of the New Testament, they describe Apollos a very Greek name as being a very fluent and, and persuasive speaker and teacher. It's not hard for us to understand them gravitating toward that. The Palestinian Jews in the congregation and, and that minority um, in the town, we can understand them having a lot of respect for Peter. One of them from our t and, and one of the insiders, one of the originals, he would have all that credibility. If what we read about appearances being so important to them culturally... Um, is true, then Paul didn't make the cut. He didn't have a very impressive profile. I thought of this, and it was confirmed. I, I said this to Janine the other day, and then we were watching a TV series we're watching, and I said, I thought to myself, do you ever notice in movies and TV, the hero, uh, you know, in an action or a crime drama, um, they have faces made out of titanium. I mean, you'll see one, uh, you'll see this fight scene and it'll all be all slow motion and guys' fists will be smashing into guys' faces and there'll be blood everywhere. And 15 minutes later, he's embracing some beauty and his hair's not even messed up. Like there's never any scars or long-term effects from serious beatings. Well, that's not reality. Think of the Apostle Paul. He often turned up in a town as a new coming in in the cold, hardly knowing anybody, showing up in the synagogue, and his previous experience just a few short days or weeks ago was 40 lashes, three times, which would be like the legal limit he could have gotten in the last town. And then he jumps on a boat and travels for a couple of weeks, and we're not talking a cruise ship, and there's no antibiotics, no great first aid treatment going, or even knowledge of how to fight infections, and then he'd show up in the synagogue, limping in, all bloodied and scarred up, telling them the great news of this gospel for all people. How would you think if a guy walked in here, if I brought in a guest speaker, and the guy comes up and he takes the pulpit, and his face is still all swollen, he can only see out of one eye, you know, and it's like, what's with this guy? Uh, Paul showed up like, so when he says things like, we came in weakness, this is in that culture, in that way, that's something for us to think about. It's, it's a background. He was probably not a great public speaker. I, I learned that from a biography. You could fill in the blanks with your five favorite celebrity speakers that you have out there, or even some of the the last couple of years, we've had a lot just kind of hit the ditch and go out in flames. They're all probably better public speakers than Paul would have been. It's weird for us to think that, but they probably were. And Paul's saying that's not where the power comes from. These, these people that he's being unfairly compared to were probably all better speakers than he was. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, on top of that, uh, our, our survey, our, our overview told us about this idea of Paul not taking money from them. It, it, our, our outline gave us the reason for that, but the, what they thought was, Paul, you're too proud to even take any money from us. You're here and you're, you're too good for us to, to accept our money. Um, so here's the, kind of the preconceived ideas they have about Paul. And Paul has to explain himself on that. They also rejected him because he called out sin. It's probably another good reason 
You know, wayward members seven years later are still flirting with pagan temple practices, fornication, all kinds of things, and Paul called them out on it. So I think they think he's overly zealous. He's too much of a hardliner. They, 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 they don't believe that gospel ministry has anything to do with that stuff. That's none of your business. That's nothing to do with. And Paul's saying, oh, contraire. I still have things to say about that. On the other hand, and lastly or secondly um, or fifthly, uh, in a completely different category than Peter and Apollos, there were these unnamed super apostles, these ministers of and apostles. Chapter 11 is going to show Paul's really, doesn't, it's not going to show air quotes, but that's kind of when Paul uses these terms. This is what they call themselves. And Paul's going after them um, after they've been on the scene. And this, again, this is one of those areas where uh, you'll read a lot of books and commentaries and, and uh, you know, composite sketches, you know, another, another TV crime drama thing, you know, the police will be talking to somebody and trying to make a composite sketch. That's all we have, really, about who were these false teachers and what was their problem and all of that kind of stuff. And we don't really have all the answers to those questions, but as Paul responds to them, he defends his own doctrine and his own teaching. And so without even necessarily knowing what their falsehoods were, we get Paul giving us some capital A apostolic teaching about what genuine gospel ministry really is. Um, Paul will help us grow in our understanding of the real thing. That's all I have to say to kick this off, but I have homework for you. Can you believe that? Homework. And, and uh, I've got a slide here that says 40 minutes. So I just looked it up online. You know, how long does it take to read certain books of the Bible? I found the whole list. So 2 Corinthians, you could read in 40 minutes. Um, some of you are like, I'm not going to read anything for 40 minutes, so I can make it even easier. <laughs> Try listening to it, listening to it once a week for the next eight months. There are all kinds of different things that I could send you, or, but I mean, it's pretty easy to find links. I'll send one out later today that's one off Spotify. It's just somebody reading 2 Corinthians. And if you don't like the um, synthesizers and the hip-hop beat in the background, you can find your own version of it and you can listen to it. I tested this today. Me and Bernice did our devotions. That's my lab. And we got through 10 chapters and it wasn't even a regular long walk, right? So your dog will love this too. You might say, oh, I don't even have a dog. That's okay. I'm supposed to forgive you as God forgive you of your sins as God's forgiven me. Go for a long walk once a week. You might be a commuter. You might be a commuter and uh, you've got a 40-minute ride to work. Well, one day a week between the way there and back, you could listen to 2 Corinthians being read to you. Um, I know that the few times that I've done this when I'm working through a sermon series have been really helpful because you start to hear it all and and already today, there's some things that I think as we do this series, it's like, I think I might just do that all in one sermon rather than nine of them on that same topic. But just listen to it. Let it soak in. Listen to it over and over again. If you're a journal, a journal or write down some questions, insights as you do that. You know, women have already said there's a, there's a Bible study starting in two weeks to help augment uh, the teaching of 2 Corinthians and give you another whole way to look at it and work through it. God's Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. But so, I just want to challenge you. You're stuck. If you're going to keep coming back, you're stuck hearing about this letter for a few months. You might as well go deeper in it and hear it being reviewed and, and get the most you can out of this. All right? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the evidences that even a letter written by this strange man, Paul, 2,000 years later, is still being used by the Holy Spirit to grow churches up into maturity. Uh, your vision and your um, idea of what a genuine church is and, and what being a Christian is and what Christian values really are and what Christian ministry really is. Lord, I pray you will, your grace would bless us to grow in those same things together. We ask this in Jesus' name.